Okay, we are going live. Good evening. Welcome, viewers. Extremely sorry to be 13 minutes late. Uh, there were a lot of technical problems. Again, our, our mistake, our apologies. Please bear with us. I promise you that this will be an extremely interesting, exhilarating conversation. Thank you for joining. To a majority of the Indian uh, citizens, environment is something outside the boundary of daily life and uh, work, something extracurricular that is somehow linked to the hobbies like, say, wildlife photography or, uh, you know, uh, picnicking in the wild hobbies. Is that what environment is? To some others, it involves concerns like clean air, organic food, tree planting ceremonies. To others, it is anti-development negativism, saying no to factories, mines, expressways, GMOs. Today, Dr. Debal Deb will discuss how the environment is what enwraps us and is constituted by biodiversity. All life forms, including humans, and is our fundamental life support system. Any mode of economic activity that is blind to its impact on the environment is bound to collapse. The mainstream mode of industrial development has already shown signs of failure. With peak oil, collapsing national economies, rising global temperature, greenhouse gases, and escalating rates of species extinction, unemployment, hunger, suicides, which we see in industrial society. Dr. Dave will discuss only one aspect of the role of biodiversity today in ensuring food security of the nation. With me today, as I moderate this show, are some excellent panelists, and let me introduce them to you. We, you can see on your screen, Mimansha Singh, Mimansha hails from Howrah City, West Bengal. She's a law graduate from JSS Law School, Mysuru, and has recently completed her LLM in Access to Justice from Tata Institute of Fundamental Sciences in Mumbai. She currently serves as the executive director of Red Cycle, a grassroots movement aimed at spreading menstrual health awareness and has been key in organizing sessions, projects, and campaigns with regard to this movement. She's a writer, and hold your breath, at The Urban Marxist, an Instagram medium-based political blog. She has interned with Apne Aap Women Worldwide Kolkata, Human Rights Law Network Delhi, Calcutta High Court, Supreme Court, and Maharashtra State Commission for Women. But here is her badge of honor. She was one of the 29 young people arrested for saving the array forest, the array movement in Mumbai. Also on your screen with a black beard is Kapil Agarwal. Kapil hails from Kanpur, Uttar Pradesh. He is a law graduate from IP University, Delhi. And Kapil has also recently completed his LLM in Access to Justice from TIT Mumbai. He's a member of the National Cabinet of Youth for Swaraj. And he too wears a badge of honor. He was one of the 29 arrested in Save Array Movement in Mumbai. The gentleman with the white beard on your screen is none other than Dr. Debal Dev. Dr. Dave is a biologist with doctorate in ecology from Calcutta University. He conducted postdoctoral research in human ecology of estuarine resources using estuarine resource use at the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, in 1988, and 
in ecological economics at the University of California at Berkeley as a Ford Foundation Fellow in 2001 and a Fulbright Scholar in 2009. I'm sorry, that will be Fulbright Fellow. In 1997, Dr. Dave founded Vrihi, the Sanskrit word for rice, which is India's largest open source rice seed bank conserving 1,230 folk varieties of rice and a research farm, Boshudha, to demonstrate ecological ag agriculture, eco-forestry, alternative energy use, and ecological architecture. His laboratory is engaged in study of nutraceutical properties of numerous uncultivated food plants and hundreds of rice varieties. In 2014, Dr. Dave established the first ever community laboratory for biotechnology where he does cutting edge research for protecting indigenous species against biopiracy. Dr. Dave's conservation and research work are supported by donations from friends and well-wishers. His action research has rescued not only 1,440 varieties of rice, but also several endangered plants and many ancient sacred groves from extinction and revived many forgotten indigenous sports and musical traditions in Bengal and Southern Urissa. His freelance research in agroecology, crop genetic diversity, forest ecology, and ecological economics have been widely published in international journals, including Nature and Oikos. His latest book, Beyond Developmentality, Constructive Inclusive Freedom and Sustainability, published in 2009 by Earthscan and Routledge, contributes to development studies and, economical, and ecological economics. Now, most of you will not remember any of the things that I said. What is important and can be remembered is Dr. Dave lives an ecological life. He is not a scientist who works in a laboratory has, and has no connection with the earth outside. I have been to his farm in Urissa, in southern Urissa. He lives that ecological life every day, 365 days a year. So he is a barefoot scientist, as many have chosen to call him. Uh, Kapil Agarwal and Mimansha Singh are very young environmental activists. And uh, they are here today sharing this show. And they have questions to ask Dr. Dave. And Dr. Dave, with his 50 years of experience and working in this field, will attempt to answer these questions and share with our viewers uh, thoughts on ecology, environment, and how to take it forward. May I request uh, first uh, Mimansha to shoot the first question at Dr. Dave. Right. So, uh, so sir, the first question that I have for you is as to why is the environment important for our civilization? And what should the common people, the general mass, know in order to care for environmental integrity. Thank you everyone, and thank you for the uh, introduction as uh, we get this initial question, which is very motivating. And I hope I will be able to, answer to motivate many people in understanding, in attaining a proper understanding of the environment. Uh, as Abhik has uh, already discussed about this, you know, the common understanding of, or I would say, incomplete understanding of the environment. Uh, that is something it usually people when say we have to save the environment, we have to protect the environment, etc. It implicitly suggests that we, the speaker, the humans, are one entity and the environment is outside them, is another. So this dichotomy of this understanding, dichotomization of the environment as a separate thing out there is the basic misunderstanding of the environment. We are an integral 
part of the bond formula. So when we say we to protect the environment, it, we, it should mean that should protect ourselves, our own life, life itself. Because environment is not something outside our home and the workplace. The home itself is a part of the environment. The workplace is a part of the environment where we live in. And the environment is not just the air and water and you know, sun and moon and the trees around. It's total of all the components and uh, also the I just know the inmate so called my items in the built in and natural environment altogether. So this is what we have to uh, understand that when we say we are we need to conserve the environment, the ultimate object is not not for the sake of the environment per se. But it's for the sake of our own life support system. Essentially, it's not kind of you know kindness to nature or the generosity to nature environment, but it's a ultimately a specific act to preserve ourselves, to sustain our own lives. So we we need to protect and save the environment. We are ultimately going to save ourselves. So this is ultimately a selfish interest that every man should understand when they say we need to save the environment. This is the primary understanding of, of the environment, that it's not something out there, it's not an association, it's not critical, uh, the other, uh, apart, aside from us, below us, we are sitting on top of something that we are actually uh, making, we are making ourselves an art of this. This is the main thing, so when we know that this global temperature, average climate, average temperature is rising, and it's become so hot that uh, just this recent uh, the storm that hit this Bengal, lower I mean, South Bengal, in the Bay of Bengal, and it was continually you no know, fermenting because of this extremely hotter climate, higher higher temperature, higher average temperature than any other years previously. And the global average temperature is rising. And now it is uh, over the past thousand years, the highest global temperature that we have reached this year. Similarly, we have already reached the, the ceiling was the prediction of I uh -huh. 110 of carbon dioxide. This year, we have actually hit this, not only the ceiling, but now this is the floor. Now we are above 115 ppm this year from February onwards. And this concentration of 115 ppm is the lowest that we have reached. And we have attained that high level of carbon dioxide 30 years before the prediction. So we are actually moving fast toward the, you know, the doomsday, so to say, of human civilization. And there's you no know, thousands and thousands of species are going extinct. And the current rate of species extinction is more than 1,200 times more than the background rate of extinction over the past 200 years. So in all senses, you know, all this kind of pollution, uh, climate, uh, the instabilities, temperature rise, carbon dioxide, methane emission, and then we know the uh, permafrost of Siberia, permafrost of Canada, both of these permafrost, which were you know, being frozen for more than 30,000 years, are now meltdown. No sea is melted. So all of this gas is going to lead to the, by the human species. When we take up the environment, to think, we should understand that we are actually going to care of ourselves, our own survival. So, the who is of we the survive? I mean, we the purveyor of this environment, we the benefactor of I should God. This this is the message that I wanted to convey. All the people to understand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dev. Uh, Kapil Bhai, if I can now ask you. Uh, for the second question. <coughs> uh, one uh, minute before, before, before you uh, start. Before you start, uh, Kapil. Uh, 
I am not being able to hear Dr. Dev very clearly. His voice is breaking. Is it my internet yes. connection or is it his internet connection? No, sir. I think it's uh, Dev Dev's internet connection because uh, in between there are some disturbances. And what about my voice? Yes. Is it is it audible to it's you? Fine. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. Audible. Uh, I I hear you. Oh, this is cracking. Okay, okay. Kapil Bhai, please. Uh, your question. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dev, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, like, what is the importance of biodiversity in the entire environmental uh, discourse? Because we don't hear a lot about biodiversity, but it is, I think, very important. Please explain it to us. Yes, uh, definitely. Thank you, Kapil. This is a very important question. Uh, as I said, you know, environment has biotic component and abiotic component. That is non-biological, non-living component, which means you know the soil, water, air, uh, different kinds of you know, gas composition of the air, uh, temperature, rainfall patterns, and all these. These are the abiotic. But the biotic component, that is all kinds of life forms taken together from viruses. That includes this COVID-19 virus too, uh, to the largest of the mammals, the spar whale, and so on. All of this is the biodiversity. And when we say environment, this is the composed and also influenced by the action of biodiversity too. So when we consider soil, it's not an inert material in the place. Soil in every part of the world was created by biological actions of different living life forms. So, for example, lichens, fungi, bacteria, different kinds of you know, insect larvae, and many other organisms, you know, they have sequentially, they have worked on the basal rock surface, created soil. And then the living soil consists of millions of bacteria and many other microbes, micro, micro and uh, fungi and all this without which the soil cannot sustain life. So when they, whatever way we are making, even the environment, the, the atmosphere, they are breathing, this atmosphere, this atmosphere also is a result of biotic action by earliest living forms from four million years ago. And because of those, you know, uh, the action of those uh, primordial life forms, uh, they breathe oxygen out. Then molecule by molecule, this oxygen of this atmosphere, and in the process, about 3.7 billion years ago, all those organisms, you know, they died off. That was the first major extinction episode in you in the Earth's history. And now, today we are because oxygen in the atmosphere is the most healthy because that's where we live. But it's also created by earlier life forms. So whenever we talk of this, you know, even the wire component of the, of the environment is a result of the of activity of the bypass. Whatever is in parts of the environment without which are you know, me and, and no existence. But I wanted to show, I mean, unfortunately, for some technical reasons, which actually delayed all of us, uh, we cannot show many of these uh, slides. I mean, some of the uh, visuals I have loved to show you, but I'm try to uh, describe it verbally. Is that you no? Know, we can we always value biodiversity when it has some kind of direct value or indirect uses, direct and indirect uses. So, for example, food uh, for everyone. Any anything that we eat today is coming from biodiversity whether it's rice or brinjal, any kinds of vegetable, meat, eggs, milk, all of these either coming from plant or from animals uh, or microbes also like yogurt, curd, buttermilk. They are formed by bacteria, you know, lactobacter and all this, acting on the milk, which is the animal product. So all of these you know, bacteria, plants and animal kingdom are providing the, all the foods of all the humans over, over the world, all over the world, excepting a few mineral salts and uh, some very few of the synthetic vitamins, which are also in a synthesized using bacteria in the laboratory. 
So ultimately, for every item of food excepting mineral salts, we are depending on biodiversity. So this is a direct use value. Similarly, for all kinds of you know carbon dioxide that is you know uh, absorbed by the by the trees, I mean plants, oxygen breathed out by them by, through photosynthesis, and any kinds of activity, any kinds of life's activity for which we depend on biodiversity are called direct use value. And this use value is estimated by a market value because most of this direct use value is can be sold or bought from the market. It could be food, fodder, fuel, structural items like you know our furniture uh, that comes from the trees. I mean wooden furniture or whatever. And then medicinal. Uh, Ninety percent of the medicines of all the world uh, of all kind of pathies, you know, homeopathy, uh, modern medicine, Ayurvedic, and Unani, and all of these are all coming from mostly. Ninety percent of them are coming from biodiverse and uh, ornamental, recreational, religious uses. All of these are direct use value, and we can buy or sell most of these products in the market. So economists have can give a value because it has a monetary value. The second part of this use value is indirect use value of biodiversity, which cannot be bought or sold on the market. So like this, you know, the albedo effect of a tree or the tree giving shape. So in the summer, in a hot summer uh, noon, you are extremely tired and hot and you stand under the shade of a tree. Now this is an indirect use value. Every human uses the shadow or shade of a tree or a forest. But you cannot buy, uh, you know, you cannot go to the market to buy one kilo or one liter of shade. So it has no monetary value, but but everyone enjoys it. And because it cannot be bought or sold, the shade, the service of this a tree, uh, cannot be owned by any individual because it's indirect use value. We know it's used, but it's used by everyone, and it's direct. So it could be carbon sequestration, photosynthetic activity, and the carbon is sequestered so that the emission, you know, is reduced. Uh, pH binding, pH buffering of the soil, uh, oxygen balance, water recharging in the groundwater. You know, the rainwater rainwater part collates down to the water table, uh, so through water seepage, and that is facilitated by biodiversity, like a forest, for example, and bacterial action in the in the soil. Nutrient cycling. It's always an activity of microbial and uh, biodiversity, I think, and so on and so forth. So these, you know, they, ha they have no direct market value, but economists have devised different kinds of ways of indirect estimation of approximation of the monetary value of, uh, say, oxygen production or shadow and all of these. But there's the third component of biodiversity value, which is called non-use value. We don't use them either directly or indirectly, but we only consider that their existence is enough. We existence, the existence of a tree itself. Now, uh, we know that you and I, and uh, I mean all the people, and probably most of the audience, uh, the members of the audience, have never visited the Brazilian rainforest. Okay. But we we all know that you no know, Brazilian rainforest is important, and majority of us would even contribute some kind of you know maybe 10 rupees to 200 rupees to save the Brazilian rainforest. Well, not calculating how many miles of oxygen we are breathing, but that is coming from Brazil. Okay? We're not we're not expecting to eat any fruit from the Brazilian rainforest, but all of us want that Brazilian rainforest destruction should be stopped immediately because that's the lungs of the earth. Now, this valuation, I mean, we give this value to the existence of the Brazilian rainforest is its use, its non-use value. We don't use them. We would expect to use them and uh, expect any material gain from this forest, but we want them to conserve. Similarly, many of us know, maybe I'm sure you have not visited the Sundarban, Sundarban of West Bengal. Have you? Have you seen the Royal Bengal Tiger in the Sundarban? I have, but... Uh, you have, but uh, not uh, not everyone, right? But I have not seen the tiger, Royal Bengal tiger. Have you? Not talking of seeing a tiger. You see a forest in the Netherlands. No, but you but you give importance to an organization which says we want to save the tiger, okay. and you don't care whether this you know the. 
by seeing the tiger or by saving the tiger, you are going to earn any extra two molecules of oxygen to breathe or any fruit from this you know, Sundarban that you can eat. Okay? Nobody expects it. But we all want this to survive. We all want this to survive. And that is extent. Okay? So existence value is some, that has nothing to do with the market price, nothing to do with direct uh, use of any product of that biodiversity. But we need its existence. Similarly, there is big quest value. We, I have seen hundreds of older people in Himalayan rainforest, uh, sorry, Himalayan forest and Northeast rainforest, and in Odisha forest, where 80 year old women or 70 year old men, they, I have seen them planting trees just growing, and we fruit maybe 20 years, or 20 years later, which means expect the fruit, they never expect to eat that fruit from the tree that they are planting today. They plant it so that the next generation will consume that fruit. Okay. And this, this is a kind of bequest that bequeath this tree to the next generation. The next generation is necessarily their blood descendant. It's not their sons and daughters and granddaughters. It's the general population of the next generation. This is bequest value that we bequeath this resource for the next generation, which is beyond the calculation of the mainstream economics of benefit, because the benefit does not accrue to the self, the individual who plants the seed. Okay. And, but all the indigenous people have nurtured this biggest value of body. But has all kind of cultural value, use value, and not all of these. So, now that, that's the, you know, is a very nutshell, very nutshell, you know, the very small nutshell. The biodiversity has every part of our economy and our life and culture. Biodiversity has a role. We can't imagine any kind of society, any kind of individual life, which does not depend on biodiversity for this or that. That's the main uh, thing, and we. Most of us are not aware of the biodiversity component, which actually gives us subsistence. Uh, how many people understand that the, the curd or yogurt or the buttermilk they are drinking is a product by microbes, by bacteria? So, uh, but without that bacteria, I would meant most of these in the wines. You know, people know that you no know, wine is fermented by using bacteria, different kinds of bacteria. But the yogurt, not, I'm not saying nobody, but many people don't know. So, but bacteria, this biodiversity, and your biodiversity uh, is by default is using, uh, is being used, regardless of the knowledge of the consumer. This is the value of biodiversity, without which our culture will not survive. Right. Thank you, Dr. Dev. Uh, Thank you for two things. One, the very lucid explanation, which somehow, of course, uh, uh, not everyone could hear because of your weak internet. And thank you for now doing something. I don't know what you've done, but your voice was very audible in the last 40, 50 seconds. Uh, is that right, Mimansha and Kapil? Yes, sir. Yes. So, yes, sir. so uh, Dr. Desh, for the sake of this show, uh, long live internet, at least for the next one hour. So that we can all yes. hear you clear. Uh, yes. Mimansha, yes, may I ask you for the uh, third question, please? Yes, sir. So, sir, what I understand is that biodiversity is not just wildlife, but it also includes domesticated life forms, right? So, uh, taking from that, how important do you think is this uh, set of biodiversity in human economy? Uh, now, now it's my turn to hear. You no, know, very, uh, it's not very audible. Uh, the voice is cracking. Uh, most okay, of the I, will, is saying, I, I will just I repeat, repeat it one second. I just repeat it. Sir. So, what I understood is that uh, biodiversity is not just wildlife, but it also includes domesticated life forms. So, taking from that, how important do you think is this set of biodiversity? in human economy yeah 
uh, I already described this, you know, this, uh, the role of biodiversity in human economy, uh, but I was primarily, you know, uh, referring to this, you know, the bacteria and other wildlife. Uh, yeah. I mean, people understood wildlife is the only biodiversity. But a part of biodiversity, and uh, it's a small part, but it's a very significant part of total biodiversity was created by humans. That is created by domestication. And I consciously use on creation because before the domestication of those species, they did not exist on Earth. Okay? So, for example, the dog, uh, the species dog, Canis familiaris, this species did not exist on Earth 17,000 years ago until they were domesticated by humans through breeding experiments from the population of the Eurasian wolf. So Eurasian wolf was the, you know, given that evolved by natural select. It was in nature. But 17,000 years ago, the early humans started domesticating pups of this uh, wolf. And then 17 years ago was the first creation of a species that we now call dog, Canis familiaris. Uh, now, there is no wild dog, no wild dog species in the world at all, okay? uh, because it was always domesticated. Similarly, you won't find any wild cow. You won't find any wild you know, uh, uh, ducks or uh, horse, wild horse, wild donkey, wild uh, chicken, any kind of thing. I mean, not of the same species. We all have wild ancestors of those species. We have wild ancestors of the cow, wild ancestor of dog, which is extinct, of course. Shavalski horse that was domesticated in Malpolia. Uh, we still have this wild ancestor of donkey, uh, wild donkey population in Grat, Ranakach. But that's the same species as the kids domesticated. This is a new species altogether. Similarly, for all the food that we eat today, uh, rice or wheat, corn, potato, banana, papaya, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, you name it. Everything that we eat all over the world uh, that they cultivated in agricultural fields like domesticated. And this domestication of crops and animals, excepting all that was 7,000 years ago, but all the crops that we are eating today, that they start at exist about 12,000 ago, the first agricultural revolution. Uh, and this agricultural revolution is you now, it was the beginning of uh, 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 this, you know, the agriculture. So if uh, we misguided Created, I mean, means humans have created more than 200 species of plants uh, which were, did not exist for this agricultural revolution. And they have created 40 new animals, 40 domesticated animals, uh, that includes mammals and birds. And they did not exist till 10 to 12,000 years ago. Uh, so this, this is the, the creation of. Uh, humans and the domesticate part of their diversity uh, which is extremely important and the AI economy uh, you know subsists mm -hmm. on the supply of this cultivation of crops and domesticated animals animal husbandry the entire demand of the culture for which we, on which we all and even learn but it's not the case in peace but also humanity had expanded the genetic diversity of each, each species, each new species. For example, for dog to be. Dog is one species, but there's 23,000 breeds all over the world. 23,000 mm. varieties or breeds of dog, one single species. For crops, for example, we had in India 152 varieties, pure varieties of mango which we seed to seed, it's not a grafting, it's not a hybrid, but pure line mm -hmm. means, you know, you, you sow the seed and it will breed to exactly the same right with all that mango. So 152 varieties of mango existed until 1970. Today, we have lost most of them. And now 
not even 28 varieties are surviving in India. Rice is the uh, is a paradise. Until 1907, India was the home to 110,000 varieties. I repeat, 110,000 varieties of Indian rice, and majority of them, 90% of them, are now lost because of modernization and industrialization of agriculture, which has emphasized on monoculture or just a few modern rights of rice, uh, which are supplied by the government or uh, corporate sector. Because of that, we have lost thousands and thousands of rice beginning in 1965. So in just a period of 40 years, we have lost 90 percent of that rice. So people, I mean, humans took more than 1,000 years to create this enormous diversity of domesticated and animal species. But it took only 32 years of modern development in agriculture to destroy them, to erode this enormous diversity in favor of culture, industrial growth of agriculture. So that's the you know, sad side in tragic side of the erosion of biodiversity is not only this, you know, the killing, I mean, by hunting or overhunting or habitat destruction that wild species are lost, but we are also destroying our own creation. There's no domesticated species and varieties through industrialization of agriculture. Kapil. Uh, yes. Next question. So, Dr. Uh, Dave, sir, uh, I would like to ask you that human civilization has fostered agro, uh, agro, uh, agro, agro, uh, yeah, for the sake of economy, agro, for the sake of economy, but what we are seeing right now is that the modern civilization is going against it, it's uh, destroying it. Sorry, I, I can't hear the last part of your statement after yes. biodiversity. Kapil, you're not. The last part. Kapil, you're not audible. Hello. Yeah. Kapil, just repeat yeah. the question once. Yes, yes. Are you, I am uh, audible now? There is a lot audible of now? crackle. There's a lot of crackle, a lot of static. Yes, yes. Okay. okay. Now you're not audible at all. Let me try. I don't I think you're audible now. Wait. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sir, I was asking you if uh, like, the human civilization has fostered agro biodiversity for the enhancement of economy. Uh, but what we are seeing. Couple, 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 couple. Uh, Kapil, I think you know, it's better you you write the question uh, on the chat, uh -huh. and then I that may be easier. Yeah. Maybe Avi can Avi can read out the, his writing on the chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh. Am I audible now? Yes, you're better. You're better. Yes, go ahead. Much better. Go ahead. Yes, 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 yes. Sir, I was asking you that human civilization has fostered agro biodiversity for the sake of economy in the last few decades, uh, in the uh, earlier on. But now, what we are seeing is that uh, in the modern economy, we are destroying this agro biodiversity for the sake of economy. 
so how do you see this paradoxical relationship between the two form of economies and what we are uh, they are doing to the agro biodiversity ah yes okay yeah thank you yeah you uh, you got this you know the right uh, thread of what i wanted to convey uh you write that initially at least uh, at the time of the first agricultural revolution when people started domesticating uh, crops and animals you know, it was 12000 years 2000 years ago uh, that process continued you know and they uh, added some new life forms to the list of biodiversity existing on the earth they uh, they create new of these new species whether it's dog or rice or donkey and uh, they never existed and they also expanded the genetic diversity that is different varieties and different breeds of animals and and uh, plants to grow uh, and that was to enhance their own economy of survival so earlier they were all depending on certain you know uncertain uh, uh, uncertain availability of the food earlier so in order to cope with that uncertainty they adopted this agricultural things you know growing these animals rearing animal uh, growing uh, crops and so on so at one point the idea is to enhance the economy you know the economy of economy by this and they stop agriculture but as we stabilized our economy the whole economy uh, went uh, diff- in a different direction there the survival of humanity as a species was not priority the priority became uh, accumulation of wealth in fewer and fewer hands at the expense of the equilibrium of the whole system is that instead of adding new species instead of enhancing diversity of the life support systems and the integrity of the ecosystem we are decimating it we have start we started decimating it and to the agricultural uh, second agricultural revolution green revolution and so on and so forth we have this need this diversity so just like i uh, like uh, you know 110000 right right in india we now have more than 6000 right is left this is massive genocide i would say now it is about it because everybody is happy with one or two varieties of uh, high yielding variety because everyone believes that high yield is important for the survival of humanity which is exactly the opposite to of the reality the ground reality is that uh, because of snow of course we have achieved no huge amount of productivity in ice or potato or tomato what's the result the result is the pocket famines pocket them in different places of the, not only sahel if you go in kalahari in odisha that continued for 10 years uh at the same time when in was using omat and so it was produced that it was not going to the market it was rotting in the government storehouses and the parliament was discussing of down you know the 14000 ton of thing grain of ice cream in the arabian sea because they were not consumable at all and government's own estimate is that more than 50% of the of grains in government storehouses are not the private storehouses government stores alone 15% of the grains are lost to rodents rats and mice so it and at the same time during this period thousands of people are dying of starvation so why the government claims that the storage and the production of this food crop in this last year as the uh, minister of food uh, declare that we have in food to feed the data in the if this zero production this we can see that some thousands have died hunger okay. so overproduction necessarily the only uh, the uh, the necessary and sufficient condition for food security is the distribution the other we have also known in odisha two years back it was over surplus production the result was that the price of tomato to the farm came down to 80 by 70 in bengal uh, 
in 2002 and 3 the potato price came down to 10 sub per kg and there were many four potato farmers who committed suicide <coughs> in odisha tomato farmers couldn't get this price i mean this 20 paisa per kg which means you know they couldn't even afford to repay the repay the labor payment for harvesting of the transport to the market and so on and so forth so and the farmers suicide continues whether it's bt cotton or over production of potato or over production of rice or whatever price always fluctuates despite the fact the government has instituted the minimum support price the minimum support price goes to a very small fraction of the track from of the uh, farmers majority of farmers uh, go undergo the distress sale and the distress sale because they can't eat anything until unless they sell their own produce at 50 times 60 times less across the market so and hunger persists so if the overproduction leads to death of a uh, farmer producer from hunger if it leads to committing farmer suicide then it is not sustainable production at all so overproduction is never the solution to food food insecurity so that is the major thing and that is of our own make is making up the self but it's the make up the system of industrialization of agriculture where biodiversity of the production system was decimated mercilessly so it's not only you know 15 varieties of rice in one farm is only one variety is not only in is not the traditional process i mean traditional custom of producing a film very feeling the crops uh like the beef rice alongside rice there would be different kinds of you know oil seeds vegetables pulses you no know, beans and all these now people have i mean the green revolution has trained farmers to go for rice after rice after rice or wheat after wheat after wheat in the case of punjab and then this action not go without the external inputs and the external inputs in the form of fertilizers pesticides uh, different kinds of you know irrigation pumping systems which depletes the groundwater and herbicides today uh, herbicides and pesticides all like not in you know, the targets of diseases all kinds of you know it could be uh, it could be frogs lizards birds different others you know spiders dragon flies uh, uh damsel flies and all of these they are all decimated just to protect one single crop okay? and so this entire biodiversity from the agro system is is uh, destroyed it's a kind of warfare it's kind of the farmer is waging a war against nature's forces okay? so it's a it's always a kind of uh, battling and the language is also of that you know uh the names of herbicides for example they are all violent words you know it's like war making machete lasso round up it's all kind of war making so you are actually waging a war against nature so with this you no know, lasso and machete and you kill this machete you kill with you no know, you round up the enemy this was not the case okay if this was never the case you know when this uh, green revolution i mean before the green revolution agriculture was the life giving life support system in all cultures all over the world so even in the you know the names of pesticides you have this kind of refate and you know uh killer all is so the murder of statue killing of the statue banquing the enemy with that kind of attitude you you can see that agriculture is now just a technique of winning the war and this war is against all forms of life forms all all life forms only human survives and the target crop whether it is rice or potato or wheat they only survive nothing else is out of survive and even the blade of grasses and this the the dark wheat itself was also fine the wizard is a new crop in it it was not used traditionally because it was you can see this in, you can remember i have actually this kind of exercise to uh, to study the uh, six different indian 
old Indian languages, you know, that includes Tamil and Tada, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi, and also Ladakhi language to some extent. And we did not find any single root word of wheat in any of these languages. In Hindi, for example, Khar Patwar, it's a, it's a compound word, Khar and Patwar. Okay, it's not a root word. There is not any kind of, you know, whether it's in uh, uh, Indo-Iranian root or you know, the root of in India, there is not a single root originally. We have a new concept brought out about it by uh, modern agriculture, which considers any unwanted crop, any unwanted plant that grows in the crop field. But in nature, in science, there's not a single crop it lack or yield. It can be anything, you know. If you are growing rice and if you find that some kind of shag, you know, some kind of uh, edible shag is growing in your rice field, you, you consider this is a weed. But if you are growing that shag, that vegetable, and if, if you find rice or wheat coming to it, then rice or wheat becomes a weed. So how can a weed decide, how can a herbicide recognize which plant is useful and which is not useful to that particular farm, farmer. So it's a completely artificial thing and getting all this kind of hard right. Now this system farms are not only by manual eradication of weed, now it's completely eradication by using herbicide that eliminates not only the plant, but also the ground dwelling species that includes uh, all forms of amphibia, that is frogs. There's been five papers published on this, you know, the effect of a roundup herbicide on the lives of all forms of uh, frogs uh, on the field, I mean, aquatic and terrestrial uh, frogs. And so also different kinds of, you know, aquatic life, you know, life forms, which are nothing to do with agriculture, but they are all simply because of this, the uh, use of herbicides. So this is an all out uh, warfare against nature it's not just one pest or one disease agent, but everyone around, excepting human and a crop. And because it's this unsustainability, people, I mean, the farmer has to pay more and more. Every year they have to pay more of this culture because it's not eradicates the diseases. I mean, if you consider this over the past 60 years, Indian farmers have used more than 2 million gallons of pesticides all over India. By this, by, I mean, one could expect that no kind of a pest insect would be, would be visible on Indian land at all. On the contrary, every farmer reports that every year the pest break is more severe and more number of pests are coming up. So we are actually losing the war. So far in history of human, chemistry, humans have never won the war against insects because insects always win because of their you know, liability of their genotypes and they evolve strain after strain. Even the malarial parasite, despite all advances in modern medicine, you know, all kinds of, you know, we have devised quinoid, quinoid drugs, you know, proquine, mexoquine, paraquine, all kinds of things, but we have not yet been able to control, mal eradicate malaria because the malarial parasite continues to evolve strains which our drugs have to ad adapt as a post hoc you know, adaptation. So we can never win this situation, but our ancient farmers had already attained that. We can really discuss, but the idea is that you no, know, we have to understand the value of this, you know, the uh, traditional wisdom of using nature. Uh, unless we do that, we cannot, we are actually undoing what humans had done uh, in the past over 10,000 years of creating and maintaining biodiversity for agricultural production. Thank you, Dr. Dev. I hope nobody from the government is watching this show because then they will get this idea of one nation, one paddy or something like that. So, yes. <laughs> that is a very dangerous yes. and quite a scary thought. Uh, Dr. Dev, I have uh, one last question for you. We uh, always. I, mean, I, mean, I just, uh, just one one remark on this uh, this particular comment is one nature, one nation, one uh, party, one leader, one language, one religion, etc. 
and it's no, no. I said one paddy. Of... I said one paddy. Paddy. One paddy. Yes, Let's yes, keep ourselves yes, restricted. But, uh, but in line with the same thing, which I call the monoculture of the mind, after Avadhana Shiva's, this monoculture of the mind, it began with monoculture of crops in the agriculture. Then it became monoculture of the forestry with one single species of exotic eucalyptus. And now it's monoculture of the mind in politics and education and language and everything. So, uh, <clears throat> just uh, now that you've uh, spurred me, monoculture is now uh, making its appearance through policy also. In the midst of this COVID crisis, the government has decided that each district of the country should specialize in one crop. So now, uh, the farmer of Batinda district will be growing crop X and nothing else. So not only yes. will the farm become a monoculture, the entire geography, the district will become monoculture. Anyway, yes. uh, Dr. Dev, uh, I'm sure all viewers have this important question, which plays in our mind. It is always pitched that we cannot have development without sacrificing some amount of ecology and environment. It's almost a given. Uh, stop resisting dams because we need that electricity. And if we need electricity, some, so what if 200,000 trees go? We will plant 500,000 trees. This constant battle that ecological understanding and environment have to fight with development models disturbs all of us, even those of us who understand that uh, it is necessary to have uh, ecology before anything else. Now, is there actually an alternative model of the economy where we don't have to sacrifice ecology and environment to this march and onslaught of development? Uh, let, us, let us not say we don't need development. We need development. We need environment more than we need development. Is there a way by, both, by which both these needs can be married? Uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's a short question, but it it demands a long answer. Uh, but I'm not going to give a very long answer. I mean, I have given this answer in a in a 900 page book already, uh, which I cannot repeat here in this you know short while. Uh, but I'll just you know give some you know some kind of discussion on bullet points. You know? What are the things that we can think? Uh, I wish I could show you this one particular visual, which I am able to show it now. This is a picture of a field uh, with no fencing, no end, no walls. There is just one single gate in the vast expanse of the field, just one wooden gate which is open. And there are about 10,000 sheep, and they are allowed to pass through the gate. And all these 10,000 sheep are pushing each other, thronging, to pass through that single gate to go out of that, that inn. Although there is no enclosure, there's no boundary, no wall. Which, because everyone, the sheep, it's nature, their nature to follow the leader. So the first few individuals who passed through the gate was the way, only way that all the sheep considers that's the only way they have to do. So all 10,000 sheep are following that same gate, although they could easily go to the other side from any other route, I mean, because there was no fence, no wall. So the, our situation is just like that. We, I mean, there's a word for that also. We are now sheeple instead of not people because we are not considering any other, we consider that the only gate is that single gate through which some of the predecessors had passed through, and that must be the only gate or available. Although there is no barrier, the entire alternative is the whole world open. We don't consider them as alternative because the predecessors didn't go there, so we have to pass through that same gate. And this is what I call Tina syndrome. There is no alternative. The preoccupation and the belief in this Tina. There is no alternative. It's the biggest danger of halting any alternative. Okay. So this is the biggest problem. How we devise an alternative, how such for alternative. Before that, I think the first thing is that we have to believe there is alternative. And, and I, from my own personal experience, 
uh, over the past 25 years with 15 different societies in the world. You know, in, in say, uh, Thailand with indigenous people. I know there are living flesh life example and instances of natives. We don't have to imagine, and we don't have to consider any alternative which is utopian because they don't exist. It's all only imaginary. No. The, the funnier thing is that when we say zero chemical agriculture, oh, it's an, agri it's an alternative agriculture. It's zero chemical. Stop to consider that zero chemical agriculture is the history of agriculture of 10,000 years. And chemical-based agriculture history is only 40 years. So now we consider this 40 years history as the mainstream and 10,000 years of history is the alternative. Okay. So we consider that no, if you have the hand fan in your summer, this is an alternative. But you have, if you have AC, that is the mainstream. We consider that you know, human's existence for 2 million years was without AC. Okay. AC machine came only about in our country. It was not more than 50 years old. But we consider that is the mainstream and anything beyond AC is alternative. This, you know, standing, standing this, no, uh, instead of on the, on the feet, we are standing every concept on its head and then considering that is the mainstream. So this is the attitude with which, you know, we have that first. But in our own continents, the alternative was already there. Alternative is there in flesh and blood. We don't have to think, we don't have to wreck our brains to think an alternative which is utopian. And the alternative examples that I am now going to give, just a few examples as bullet points, is I begin with some, you know, not just agriculture, pre-agricultural societies, both historically and contemporary. Even today, there are many pre-agrarian societies, which means they don't cultivate their own food. They don't grow their own food. They are pure hunter-gatherers. And these pure hunter-gatherers are not, not necessarily in Africa, not necessarily in the on the Andaman Islands or Fiji Island, but they are also existing in the USA. For example, the Menominee people, they have been still now the pure hunter-gatherers living there you know, and they're working their this kind of you know, existence for the past 30,000 years in their history. And they are one of the most sustainable society that I have seen on earth. So these alternatives are already there. People don't know because the media don't consider them you know, worthy. The TRP may, might fall. People may not be interested, but people will be interested. The main problem is that you no, know, these alternatives are not they're not no, conducive to generating crop for industry. Everyone says that I'll build a house where in the summer it will be very cool without expenditure of energy. Nobody is going to give any money to you know air coolers or air conditioners or even electric fan. Okay. So that is that economy because that will reduce GDP. GDP will increase. And if GDP does not increase, don't consider its development. Now, today, this is, again, as I said, standing an idea on its head. This is the you know, crux of this, our economy, modern economy. We always consider all this kind of bizarre perversion, perverted meaning as a true meaning of any de development. The world itself, when it was you know, first used in the 19th century, it actually meant progress and well-being of humans. And well-being actually included satisfaction of oneself. So satisfaction and health was the primary requirement of development. That was the primary basis of the word development when it was first used by Milne, in, uh, the French scholar, Milne in 19th century. Today, development only means, uh, equates with GDP growth. If there is not 10% GDP growth, it is not you know, good development. If it is pure cent GDP, it is more development. If this proportion GDP growth is less developed, and if growth is declining, you are not developing at all. You are retrograding. This kind of you know, complete reversal of meaning and standing the concept on its own head on its head, just like you know this the alternate the concept of alternative is the is the root cause of all these problems. So when we say 
we need to develop we mean we need we need to if you know so the rate of rate it goes to be higher and higher that's not meaning of development so people uh in the pre agrarian societies both contemporary and in history before agriculture too people were hunter gatherers and they did not exhaustively hunt a single animal within india there has been ample you know archaeological evidence that even despite the existence of 100 hunting gathering groups in india that existed until 1940s and the fact that these people were hunting and gathering in the forest in the wild for at least 5000 years in known history not a single species went extinct from hunting activity every year every year. but the first episode of extinction began with the modernization of forest management wildlife management so we have lost you know, after the institution of the forest department and the forest act by the uh, east india company the first uh, sorry great not after british east india company the first you no know, british empire the first forest act uh, which you know sequester forest management rules scientific forestry and so on and so forth lost 14 mammals and bird species in india now no we endangered in pre colonial forest forestry pre scientific forestry in all so despite 5000 years of regular hunting what species were pushed because of and management management of the forest we have lost four species indian chief, the last specimen of india uh, died in 1952 the last specimen of the in the bengal florican the last bird of that one that was lost in 1939 to the last uh, so the, uh, dwarf rhino of india that was living sundarbans that went went extinct in 1890s 1890s and 96 or so and there was big i'm just talking of big animals you know mammals and birds we have lost 14 14 species of them nobody counted how many insects went extinct nobody knows how many earthworms got extinct nobody knows how many other you know smaller organisms went extinct but we made them extinct and we are still pushing thousands of species toward extinction because of our scientific management of the resources to give another fact that there was a fantastic uh, study by uh uh mice rob mice published in nature and it showed that from 950s to 2000 just in this 50 year period we have decimated the entire marine fish population of all species to 90% decline 10% are living today beginning from 1950 so in just 50 years because of our industrialized fishery we have pushed to extinction all the species not just in some areas not just in some parts of the seas not just some species but all the species of marine fish and all seas all the oceans from the tropics to the poles this was the you know result of industrialization and modernization scientific management of resources in contrast to the history of all these resources on fishery for example all the artisanal fishery in the two american continents asia europe and africa we have you know thousands and thousands of indigenous fishery groups they never use this mechanized you know equipment of gear and uh, crafts and all these are handmade and all this despite these you no know, 5000 years of fishing by all these thousands of groups on all continents on the on the coastline fishery and ocean fishery marine fishery not a single fish species went extinct in 5000 years that is documented history by all biologists so if you consider this 5000 years of history of wisdom how to use the natural resource so that we all consume we all eat fish we all eat and hunt all these animals without pushing them into extinction so that we and our next generation hundreds of years you know uh, later they will survive on the resources and will serve we continue to survive compared with this our today's you know industrial ethic is that you exhaust the resource as fast as you can 
and they do leave the place. Okay. So you run for the greener pasture. So you destroy one forest for palm oil industry, for example, in Malaysia and rainforest, Indonesian rainforest is destroyed, you know, it's clean shaped every day, you know, something that something like 10, uh, 10 to 12 hectare every day is clean shaped for raising palm oil. Brazil rainforest, you know, every 20 hectare was clean, cleaned every year, I mean, every day for, for the last 10 years for growing uh, McDonald's, you know, beef export. So once once they see that this you know the paper mill industry or palm oil industry is not profitable the industry will shift to another place you know for another kind of industry it could be plastics manufacturing okay it could be another kind of you know a nylon rope manufacturing they won't stick to that kind of only palm oil palm that's diverse that's called in economy diversification of industry so they diverse in order to make in order to maintain the profit that is called sustainable business i think so the business and profit remain sustainable and that is what we misinterpret as sustainable development okay. so <laughs> this is again a pervert definition of these sustainable development means that the development of everyone uh, satisfaction and life support system for everyone that is development and that should be sustained now it is meant to sustain profit of certain industry at the cost of lives of humans and the lives of all this, you know, everything on earth, under the sun. So this is the, we have this alternative. We have this in the past. We have this contemporary uh, societies in, the, in, the, in terms of agriculture. We have hundreds of societies, even today, not only of the past societies, even today are practicing agroforestry systems. In the Northeast of India, for example, in, in Mizoram, in Nagaland, in Manipur, there are many, many societies who are still continuing it with no monoculture at all. It's not in their dream. Monoculture is not in their dream. They don't use any kind of external input to the farm, let alone you know, herbicides or pesticides. They don't use any kind of external input. The only external input in nature is uh, uh, simply the uh, uh, slate, sunlight, and air that's all and nothing else so that is the only input that they uh, that they use but no external man-made input no pump set for irrigation no agro agrochemicals no machinery okay? and it's completely you know sustainable and it's shared in this uh, in the whole society it's a community ethos it's open exchange no business with seeds. In fact, the seed business came only after the Green Revolution in the 1950s and 60s. Until that time, all over the world, seeds were the common property resource. Seed was open for everyone. This is the reason why Indians, we are eating potato and chili without thinking that both potato and chili, without which cannot, we cannot think, Indian food cannot you know, imagine any food without potato and chili virtually. But now we don't, we have forgotten that both potato and chili came from South America to the European traders in 16th century. Until that time, there was no potato in India. Until that time, there was no chili in India. Until that time, there was no cabbage and cauliflower, which came from East Europe, you know, Serbia and Herzegovina. That was the place of origin. Wheat came from Mesopotamia, which is today's Iraq, and now uh, where a big civilization, modern civilization, bobbed, bombed for to make them civilized now. So these are you know, the countries where which supplied with all the seeds, no intellectual property. There was no business at all. That nobody claimed that it's our seed, you have to pay uh, for this seed. No, seed business only came today. So this is one more important thing that in order to get back to the sustainable thing, we already have these models in history and in contemporary history, society too. First, I mean, just to gather all these you know, experiences together, a summary is that first we have to release all kinds of seeds into the community's hand, not in the corporate hand. There will be no commercialization with seeds at all. Of course, you can make business with food. You, know, you can make cook biryani and sell it, for example. You can cook you know, uh, packets of uh, pop rice or rice bubbles in America they call it rice bubbles in packets 
you can also make that because it's a processed food but seed as seed which you germinate sow and cultivate must not have a price that was the history of Hindu, human civilization until 1960. Similarly, it was the history of human civilization for 10,000 to 12,000 years that no agriculture you know, would allow any kind of external input in terms of chemicals, for example, or machinery. That was 10,000 years history and experience that sustained our agricultural output until again 40, 50 years ago. So we have to go back to that one. That was the mainstream. Now, very again, we are again giving all these misnomers. We are calling the mainstream, the historical mainstream, as alternative. Okay? Because without that kind of misnomers, industry will not grow and GDP will not grow. If you don't have any business with seeds, how can GDP grow? So this is the main problem. And the other thing is not just the hardware of seeds or the plants, but also, also the software the knowledge to use them, the software involved in which type of plant to grow, which type of crop to grow in which type of land, which season to grow, what type of crops to grow alongside which type of crop. So rice to be grown after soil seed. After rice is harvested, you grow mustard. After mustard is harvested, you grow vegetables. Alongside, when you are growing rice this season, you have also grow different kinds of lentils, you know, different kinds of mill, uh, millets and pulses, that is beans. This is the season that you have to grow. And this, all this diversity, and when you say rice, it's not just one single variety of rice. And there are hundreds of societies within India, farmer societies, who are still growing dozens of rice varieties on the same farm. And the result, the result is that they never ever experience any kind of devastating outbreak of pest or, or diseases for which they don't need any kind of external agency to spray pesticide or herbicide. They don't need any external authority to advise them. They don't need to take loans from bank or even microcredit from NGOs. Okay. That means zero external input. And that is the history, historical legacy of our system of sustainability in agricultural production. But again, production per se is not enough, as we already discussed about this, not the hunger. Hunger is not because of the lack of production, as the same himself has shown uh, very can for which he will. It's the distribution system. So on the one hand, we have enormous production of food grains. On the other hand, we have thousands of pockets of famine and thousands of people who are dying of hunger. That's because this excess production is not going to these hungry mouths, but they are going to sustain the population of mice and rats in the storehouses. And then eventually tens of thousands of rice, rotten rice grains are being dumped into the sea, whether it's in the USA or in uh, India. In the USA, for example, there's been a uh, WTO has dubbed this name green box policy that the rich farmers they are the rich farmers means you know 600 hectare of land uh, 400 hectare of land this kind of ownership of land which is beyond our, our capacity but those farmers in America are given subsidy given money by the government not to produce in this lands because if they produce all these you know, farm lands the price of the food will go down. In order to keep the price of the food high enough on the market, the farmers are given subsidy to not produce the food. If they had really produced it, it would be too much of production, then the price would fall. This green box policy was there. But even if you assume that they were producing this much enough, they would rather dump that excess production into the sea than to send this excess production to Sahel uh, or to this, you know, the Namibia or the uh, wherever this, you know, the hunger is occurring for, for decades in Africa or Mali or Palestine or wherever. Well, Palestine is too, too political. Maybe it's not politically correct to mention Palestine in this forum. But this is global reality that uh, we allow this, you know, enormous production uh, on the one hand and allow millions to die of hunger. And that is 
we call development and when we when a, whatever discussion that goes against it we call it alternative well we have much much better terms today we have much better terms in our and many others uh, although it has nothing to do with nationalism or any ism is simple you know plain fact speaking you know, telling of the facts but that is you know, that goes against the grain and and that becomes alternative so so <laughs> i think you know that's the alternative what i can say this was if someone considers this are all again utopian and theoretical uh, uh, you know puzzling these no words i would just you know end my discussion of this alternative alternative by citing my own farm basudha which is now the 25th year running and we are growing 1440 varieties of rice every year with 20 different other crops and many fruit trees and other crops uh, and we have never ever used this fire a single drop of pesticides not a single grain of fertilizers no herbicides no modern varieties and no external input of even you know loan or machinery no uh, pump set for depleting groundwater is entirely rain fed and over these 25 years despite all of these 0000 of external inputs we have never against a pest outbreak in the disease outbreak any weed clogging and we have never we never seen in any of these 1400 varieties of yield deficit so if that is a kind of an empirical evidence which is also published in peer reviewed international science journals too if we need to be more credibility to it so that is an empirical evidence that i go i stand by apart from all that i discussed about the existing flesh and blood alternatives today thank you thank you dr deb uh, uh, we have to now bring this discussion to an end but before i do so nimansha I have a question for you. So young, so spirited. What keeps you going? Can you hear me? Regarding the environment, yes, I can. I can. Regarding the environment movement, what keeps me going per se, I think, is uh, the need of the uh, movement. And I mean, we have to understand people in my generation, mine and couples' generation. Uh, we need to understand the severity of uh, the need of this movement we need to understand uh, why we are doing it the belief that we have so it's the belief is what keeps me going uh mimang sir i mean you. somehow your voice was you no know, is a metallic sound and it was a uh, kind of bell sound i could uh, understand the last part of it can you please repeat it or no? or write down on the note uh I'm really sorry. Sorry, there was some network issue on uh, my end. Um, am I audible now? You are audible, but this sound let is me, metallic. You know. Yes. Let it be. I, 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 let, let me. Uh, let me. Let me say what Vimansha said. Yes. If my voice is better. Yes. Uh, yes, that's clear. Vimansha said that we, the young people, understand the need for this environmental movement. and this is something that we do with the spirit of our soul nimansha more or less something like that yes i do believe that it, for me it is my belief in the movement that keeps me going yeah it's the belief in the movement that keeps you going uh, kapil uh, what about you what's your engine oil not there kapil your Are you on mute? Yes, Kapil, you are on mute. Yes. Kapil, what's what's your engine oil? What keeps you going? Sir, I started my journey uh, uh, as a 15 year old uh, when I uh, joined the Jan Lokpal movement and I saw that political uh, revolution coming, and I I really got interested in all the socio political issues and I wanted to understand them from in an empirical way from the ground. so during the 6 years of my legal education that is 5 years of dllb and the one year that i spent in test for llm i tried to do that that i wanted to understand all the issues from, uh, on the ground 
and in an empirical way and what i found was that the environmental movement was the crux and the uh, debate about the model of development is the crux of all the issues that we see on ground and until and unless we solve this debate and unless and until we present an alternative regarding the environmental crisis regarding the development model that we have today we cannot solve this environmental crisis and until and unless we solve this crisis there is no end to other issues that we are seeing today all the issues are more or less attached to this major issue of environmental develop uh, the model of development and the environmental crisis at hand so i thought that i will uh, devote my life or uh, for the rest of my life i will work on this issue because until and unless we solve this none other issue is going to be solved so that keeps me there. thank you kapil that is so reassuring and thank you mimansha uh, i just wanted to tell you dr dev that in this show at least sci science has been outnumbered by law mimansha kapil and i all three are lawyers and if lawyers get interested in a subject you can bet it that it will get solved so uh, there is a lot of hope if young lawyers like them are not chasing money but are con concerning themselves and dedicating their lives to uh, protecting yes. and uh, advancing the cause of environment now dr yes, dev the please. last question to you before we ask the audience to come in uh, what keeps you going it's been what 35 years 40 years what keeps you going hope oh. well there are three biblical virtues you know the christians say there are three biblical virtues uh, hope and faith okay. so i consider these three biblical virtues give me this although it's not faith in god but faith in the next generation uh, exemplified by these two young people they i have faith in these people that they will change this world much better than i was able to do it uh this is my faith i just <laughs> began and i hope this is the hope the first one that the world will change okay? and love yes of course i love this world that's why i'm doing it that's why all this no hope retains i love this you no know, the biodiversity love life including my life as i dis discussed biodiversity includes me and the environment includes myself too so biblical virtues that keeps me on <laughs> that was a great answer uh, ashutosh bhai do we have any questions from the audience which you can put on the box or send me on whatsapp or you know is there anyone who wants to ask a question to dr deb or any of our other panelists you can uh, message me on the chat box if there are no questions then we will uh, terminate the show at this point otherwise we'll take the question and uh, ask dr dev to answer it did you receive any question in writing uh, uh, so i am told i am told there are questions <clears throat> which i have received on my whatsapp just one minute please we did have very bad internet today uh, no doubt about that and uh, i mean three of us are in bengal mimansha dr deb and i and we have had uh, uh, we we have the monsoon now so it's overcast and it's raining whole day so uh, there are uh, probably that's one of the reasons why we have a network problem but no. uh, kapil in uh, kanpur what is bugging you is it rain or is it something else so it has been my inter connection internet connection for quite some days now that it is going like that i have tried to fix it in all ways but it's like that only acha so fix kare fix kare fix nahi hota wo wala baat hai okay uh, it's like uh, well, the environmental I... crisis uh ashutosh bhai <laughs> ashutosh bhai i cannot see the questions uh, uh uh please send it on the chat that will help i cannot cannot see the questions on my whatsapp
Uh, we have a question from Ritu Rao. She asks, uh, very few people understand the ill effects that development has had in all spheres. Everybody feels that development has raised the standard of living of people. People no more believe that living sustainably is the way to live. How do you change this mindset, Dr. Dev? Yeah, this is, this is the biggest uh, difficulty. We, we know this is the biggest difficulty of mindset. As I began by saying, you know, it's the, the Tina syndrome. There is no alternative. That's the first debacle that we can't see. We can't, she can't imagine that we change our lifestyle. Uh, I give a very simple and concrete example of the difficulty and also if you ask that it can solve it, it would be so easy. We see that you no know, in all the academic uh, lecture halls, lecture theaters, for example, okay, uh, universities or colleges or uh, any public lecture halls, we find it's all closed, you no, know, all windows closed, no what no uh, air and light, sunlight coming in. It's all cottoned, hold up. And in the talking, not, not cinema theater, talking of lecture halls, uh, where people give lecture and people gather you know, in the public lecture theaters, including university or academic lecture theaters. And inside the hall, we have panels of tube lights, each panel holding three or four tube lights, eight or dozen sighting. So in one hall, going something like 30, 40 tube lights in one go while at the same hour we could be in the at noon it could be in the afternoon say three o'clock or two o'clock or four o'clock the world outside is flooded with sunlight we are blocking that sunlight close the door and curtains in order to burn these 40 tube lights inside the room in order to hold this lecture the end we consider this is a good lifestyle Without this kind of standard of academic theater, you cannot have a prestigious academy, for example. And this, oh, what a fantastic you know, lecture theater. You get prestigious. You have this you no know, forum and this dais with this you no know, all this you no know, flashlight and all this. So we don't consider, I mean, we don't stop to say, why don't you change the architecture of this lecture theater in the first place? Why don't why can't we use the natural light? This is a tropical country flooded by sunlight, not Norway or not England or Scotland, where this architecture, you know, this, this architecture, the Western European architecture, adapted to the cold climate where it's always cl cloudy, always rainy. The sun is extremely rare to see most of the time of the year in England, for example, or Norway. And in Norway, of course, it's six months dark and six months so there and it's too cold so you have to close the door to the carton you have to uh, put your or heater here to keep your room warm in the in the whole whole of the year here is warm climate hot climate flooded by the sun but we never adapt our architecture we never design our architecture to adapt to our climate to our surroundings we only copy the architecture from Norway and England or Scotland, and we consider this is development, and that becomes the model of development, standard of development. It's not that there was no alternative. If you look at Agra Fort, where Shah Emperor was imprisoned, if you have ever visited Agra Fort, you will notice that in the scorching summer of May, in the month of May, in the desert of Agra, inside this Agra Fort, a cool breeze. There are hidden air tunnels and you will never sweat. How was that achieved? That was also architecture. That was also engineering, which we have dumped as backward, modern, modern, modern etc. Think of the uh, many, I can, I can talk of many other things, but just giving one example of this lecture theater itself shows that how we calculate these are the standard of life and then the second one is just from this hall. Because for these you know, three or four hours, we have to burn 40 tube lights in that single room. Then we calculate the energy expenditure required in a city. Okay? And then we calculate 
we need 3000 megawatt of consume and therefore we we justify the need of you know power grid system a nuclear power to feed that energy it all begins from that simple small smallest of this you know the micro assumption of this design of a lecture hall if you start from there you will find the futility and there is no mountain uh, it's a mountain of ignorance about the reality and the you know feasibility of an alternative existing alternative architecture which would we could easily use you know in our own system without spending any extra energy so until people come to realize up to their basic intelligence that we don't need to see picture in museum 40 tube light instead of that we just open one window and this flood of sunlight will allow us to with the diffuse sunlight will allow us to see all the pictures in the lecture theater that will solve all the problem with zero expenditure of electricity now this is one example i'm i'm this is not the only example but this is the one simplest example that shows uh, that the lack of education and the mindset and you know remember i have mentioned the power shipper all the ships 10000 ship you now going with a single gate because the predecessors went through that gate just just a few predecessors so we don't see even if we see these you know the empty spaces we don't consider them you know passable we don't dare to pass in that in that you know on train train because our predecessors just few big people went through that gate so we that's the only way until we overcome that through education i and by this education i don't mean school or curricular education education of the self cultivation of the mind cultivation of one's own quality of and think rational thinking which is which is faculty to, to every single human you know uh, even i mean including the so called retarded children of the uh, the idiot servants you know uh, they also can give you no know, brilliant uh, brilliant you no know, answers to many complicated questions which many of our you know, engineers can't and they have has a huge documentation of this you know the year seven you know giving simple which to very complex problems simply from common sense to thing now the biggest problem i think i mean this answer is the idea common sense is very uncommon because are, we are educated to not our common sense to rely on such a publication which was designed for some other place in some other context and apply this you know in our own context completely you know incoherent that is that. thank you uh, ritu has another question which is also connected to a question which arun mani dixit has asked uh, ritu asks uh, whether we can feed the whole population considering considering that the population has grown so many times using our old uh, sustainable models of agriculture and arun has asked uh, if we use these old models the sustainable models of farming in north east states like nagaland tripura etc uh, how would be the employability be affected with the increasing population he asks uh, will we be able to engage them meaningfully in the same farms so ritu has a question on using uh, uh, the um, ancient the the mainstream model of agriculture whether it is uh, uh, productive enough and uh, arun asks whether that uh, mainstream model of agriculture employs enough and uh, if it does then why do we have to go into the alternative of chemical farming have i got that yes. right dr dev i have i have called the alternative uh, as chemical farming and the mainstream is sustainable agriculture yeah yes. so these are the two questions all right i mean two ways i mean and both of these are you know the mainstream objections you know standard mainstream objection to sustainable agriculture models you know uh, the first question i uh, refers to this you know the population growth now uh the global population trend you know this you all know this you know the uh the famous 1972 publication of uh by the club of rome 
that was the first publication about this the ecological disaster of this this world is facing that was prediction and they made a series of predictions that were publicly and they made a series of predictions including this you know, global warming and all of these uh, species extinction etc etc but the one single prediction that failed all others have become you know more than proven uh, one single prediction that has failed was the enormous rate of increase in human population uh, beyond their carrying capacity that has proved and that's mainly i'm not going into the detail of the mathematics of it the model was you know based on malthusian dynamics of uh, exponential growth of human population which is not biologically realistic it it follows a logistic curve and the global trend of population is that it's now beginning to decline rate of population is now much much slower than it was predicted 120 years ago and we are definitely not going to cross the global uh, threshold i mean global limit of food resources rather the food production capability has actually outpaced this human po uh, population growth and the production is so enormous i mean food production is so enormous that it can current food production rate um, the quantity of food production can feed the entire global population for continuously for two years sitting down even if there is zero production in the coming year that's the theoretical thing i mean statistical thing but the if we go to this you know the localized systems not country wide continent wise these are all statistical standardization which actually is bound to lead astray if you go to the sustainable societies historically for example for 13000 years one single island or a cluster of island on the andaman and nicobar islands okay on the andaman islands the jarowa island one single island jarowa people had been living there for 14000 years the nicobaris <laughs> and the nicobaris are living there for more than 20000 years on one single island if our crisis of this you no know, the human nature is to propagate them as and the overpopulation and so on because there's no absolute no limit them how come the same population the same stable number is still growing there surviving there for 20000 years on the same they're not killing their babies they are not killing their old people really they are not burning the witches they are not burning the they, are, they have no sati custom okay uh, they have no no widow burning and all of these kind of things and there is no free uh, free marriage system open marriage system despite that the population growth is so minimal it has not exceeded that limit in over 10000 years living on the same single island and it's not just this you know one exception or two exceptions there in all indigenous societies uh, i am currently working with the dongri account in niamgiri hills exactly the same the, the british period census of this dongri account people was can you imagine was only 10000 heads less than the current size of the population so in the period of 150 years just 10000 people have been added and that is only counting the extra population which they where they have migrated relocated in other villages but within the same system exactly the same level so this inherent problem i mean the finding a problem in inherent biology of people that they will outpopulate themselves they are so ignorant that they will only you know they get children and children and children this is a modern episode and this modern episode is the result of adaptation to food uncertainty of the modern people so in a city if we just go by this you know the uh, we call it euphemistically footpath or pavement dwelling people okay we don't call homeless people we only call footpath dwelling people so footpath is their abode and these people need more hands to feed and in order to get more hands to help them you know begging or earning they beget more children is not for their biological joy of begetting children it's their you no know, dire necessity 
to cope with the uncertainty of feeding. And this is the major reason why all these you know, the poorer population, the extreme poor pop people, are becoming more children to our world. The moment they become more food secure, they have income security, they have old age security, they have health security, they have lesser, you know, because of medical facility, they have lower, you know, child mortality, they stop procreating. And this has been the same thing all over the world country after country, society after society. You just take, off, take England, for example. English population growth rate in the 16th century was, can you believe, 22% per annum, 11 times higher than current Indian growth rate, 22% per annum. And because of this enormous population, population explosion, this English population had to find colonies. So they had colonized Canada, America, South, South Africa, uh, Australia, New Zealand, you name it. And they settled colony after colony and they settled. Now, just imagine today, all these countries, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, USA, South Africa, they all drive these white people back home. And imagine all these white people go back to their respective origin, countries of origin. What would be the population of this Europe today? They can't sustain. So it's the European population, which was also because of their food and insecurity, they exploded in population and they had to migrate to others. That's why they had to devise their superior military power, navigation skill, otherwise they would survive. And they exploded this one. And this, this is how they appropriated. When they first settled in America, uh, the rule was that you know, a man goes on horseback and for, for how many, whatever square miles they can our boundary will be given free for this man, this land. And then in the initial years, you know, initial hundred years of this American history, the European settlers bred like lemmings. Every household was containing 12 children, 14 children who just go by this American history. So it's not this, you know, the African people and the South Asian people who are breeding that much. They are actually now breeding, you know, 20 times or to 10 times less than the European settlers that used to be. So it's not just in the current population biology that is to blame. It's the other way around. It's because of this modern system of food production and food uncertainty that's built into this industrialism that people are forced to procreate extra hands in order to survive. Wherever there is no such problem, the population is stable. So that is first one. And mm. the second yeah, that, that's the answer. And of course, it can feed this. All this, what if these 12,000 years of food production, sustainable food production, can feed all these billions of people over the world on all continents? And so much they ate that they procreated another few billions of years. Then why not now? With more and more scientific knowledge. And scientific knowledge, not technology. And and scientific knowledge includes agroecology, uh, agroecology, biodiversity knowledge and all of this, not technology of uh, gear changing or remote control technology, not with that. The third question is, I mean, the second question that uh, you said, whether they, this modern, I mean, uh, alternative form of agriculture is capable of uh, employing some of these people. Yes, of course. Uh, the problem is that no, we have again, we have changed the definition of employment. We have again, you know, uh, turned every concept on its head, you know, standing on its head. We consider employment by wage earning. Anything that does not earn any wage is unemployment. Okay. So this is why we consider this village population is unemployed, we have to recreate this employment, employment generation scheme, and so on and so forth. The, assuming that everyone is unemployed because nobody is no earning wage. Now, if we consider just about 60 years ago or 70 years ago, all over India, in every single village, there were fishermen, there were, fishers, there were potters, cut blacksmiths, copper smiths, and all of these. They were not earning wages. They were not all farmers. And they were exchanging their goods, whether through raw barter economy, 
or of course you know by money economy too so in the village market places the weaver who bring their own wares the carpenter who bring their goods the blacksmith will bring their you no know, agricultural implements and tools to be sold to the farmer and the farmer will give them this and or uh, give the food to crops themselves and this is still sustain now that was enough for each of these families to survive thrive throughout the year whenever it is necessary they receive this order bring please build me another bullock cart okay please build me another cow shed or even this you no know, pot to give to other one please give me one another hand for this to the to the carpet and so on and so forth so this was the village was a unity and a unit of economy not an individual household now we have dismantled that and then we fought what is not earned wages where is employed or daily wage is unemployed and therefore and this sudden discovery of unemployment began in 1970s with the breton woods institution breton woods institute that is world bank and imf they they designed these definitions of unemployment or employment that became a very good handle of preparing the new machinery of gdp growth because you can define any kind of income as gdp growth and then, so dr dev your your audio is completely gone yeah your audio is completely gone okay now now it's better oh okay. uh, we have one last okay. question and yeah. we have to so end the show we, now unless we redesign them and restore we ha we have to restore the original definitions of these concepts rather than sending these you know, concepts on it on their heads we are going to uh, we are going to go to the wrong explanations wrong expectations wrong solutions i would just quote malamud a famous poet saying if you are on the wrong train all the stations you arrive are wrong stations <laughs> Uh, one last question and a short answer before we close it in one minute. Uh, the question is a very interesting one. It is from Tuk Deep. He says, "Do you think moral education has an important bearing on understanding environment and solving environmental problems? Moral education. You said something about this a little while ago, which is why I wanted to bring it up again. Uh, some of the words were missing, so I guess." your question was whether this moral asks, education is he asks moral he asks whether moral education helps in building moral. a sustainable moral moral the his question moral. is moral okay. yes yes okay yes yes no our modern education is totally bereft of this kind of moral education no no where... no 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 dr dev no dr dev yes. his question is whether moral M O R A L moral education yes. morality yes whether yes, mor yes. moral education is important for uh, sustainable ecological thinking yes yes i understood that i was yeah i was saying that moral education itself i'm saying in this modern education the moral this morality is absent okay. it's totally bereft of this morality and there we consider this morality is no uh don't tell lies you know uh or you know be honest and so on and so forth but the basis of morality is about human well being okay why do why do you need you no know, uh i mean lie is not lying is bad why is you no know, honesty so valued no but in reality honesty and lie are the way life otherwise you cannot make a profit when you say that you are you are selling this and at a certain excess value and you make a profit you are lying okay you are not honest you know that you have you are you know taking extra money for this one so this is not really in the strict definition that's not really honest you know whether you are brokery the, the profession of brokery you know is not primarily honesty by by that by definition of that you know that you are actually doing this thing and you are actually giving this false information wrong information willingly so the definition if you go by this you know the definition of lie is that telling some giving a statement deliberately 
on a giving a false premise or a false information deliberately is a lie which in modern days everyone is doing including including the teachers parents some some people as the children ask something under the paper okay you grow up and give some other kind of fairy tale answer this is another kind of immoral answer if you go by that but the i would consider much more important in this morality education in this education it should be what is good for me what is good life good life is not a color tv good life is not a 30000 rupees of cell phone where you have is no 15 different apps to your life good life is not an ac car good life is not this type of style where you get this depend everything on your plastic card and you no know, exploiting other people good life is zero external input and you get all satisfaction the satisfaction is not just you no know, from 17 degree celsius temperature of your ac or two story of his story freezer but good life satisfaction where you are eating health food you have very good you no know, relationship with the people around includes in a family but in your community and you have nothing to hide and to share you have everything to share in this community that kind of morality that kind of you know value to this life uh, which is based on community and ethos and satisfaction is totally absent and because it's absent we are always taught to go more to earn more to make employment and bigger, bigger employment is means better wages bigger wages and bigger wage is better because you can get more material goods so if you have that is not enough your internet is gone that's better your internet is gone i see your internet oh. okay uh, we know. have one last question uh, we are actually very much over time but this is i need a 30 second answer from you it is do you think aquaponic vertical farms will help in reduce our dependence on industrial farms whether aquaponic will help reduce dependence on industrial farming uh, i think the internet is completely gone kapil kapil can you hear me hello kapil can you hear me i can hear you sir okay okay uh, dr dev can you hear me i think his internet is uh, finally given out so uh, thank you viewers uh, ah he's moving dr dev can you hear us can you hear me no dr dev i think your internet is uh, really uh, uh, given away so uh, so thank you dr dev thank you kapil thank you mimansha and thank you most of all to all viewers who took the time out to join this uh, youth for swaraj will come back with many more such interesting sessions we shall be getting into the core of the issue and this will not just be talking we will be acting on whatever we talk thank you good evening and uh, we look forward to seeing you again on our sessions on youth for swaraj thank you Thank you so much.